this is a presentation of a, a, um, a clinical trial that was um, completed the first section of the 12 month follow up and we're still collecting data for the, um, a three year uh, follow up point as well. I think people are very well aware that problem gambling is a significant public health and social issue. And in this country, as in some other jurisdictions, a substantial amount of funding is actually deployed to provide services. Um, <coughs> and in this country, there are a range of services, including a national helpline and a, a wide range of face-to-face uh, -face counseling options and also various other interventions. But there's been no formal evaluation of the effectiveness in general or with specific groups. If we look globally, there is a weak evidence base. The <coughs> efficacy, effectiveness and outcome studies are, are limited. It's actually surprising, um, even outcome studies, which are relatively straightforward to carry out, where you <coughs> simply follow people who are in a particular program over time. So that e that, you know, even those relatively simple studies are not um, as common as one would expect. Uh, there is a body of research on, on pharmacological and psychological therapies, and three forms of psychological therapy can be deemed possibly efficacious. And one of those is a brief intervention involving a motivational interview and a self-help uh, workbook. Uh, David Hodgins and colleagues in Canada developed this but none of the interventions available have been demonstrated to have efficacy in clinical and community settings. Now, efficacy is a, is a, is a fairly tight test. Um, it has to really, we have to have an intervention that's been evaluated um, by investigators who are independent of the people who developed that program. And it needs to have been replicated. There needs to have been two studies demonstrating um, effectiveness. And then it has to be done in real life settings as well, not just through, you know, volunteers in a non-clinical setting. Okay, so the objective of this of the trial in New Zealand was to inform policy and practice leading to better outcomes for problem gamblers and a reduction in gambling harm. And the main aims were to evaluate effectiveness, and you can read the rest of it, to describe standard care and evaluate relative to brief interventions that had previously been assessed in a, a trial, a clinical trial, and to complete the first module for a multi-site international RCT. So we were also looking at com making comparisons with studies in other countries, and we're, we're doing that with Canada currently, um, but we're hopeful that it will also be um, picked up elsewhere, funded by the Ministry of Health. So they're the list of um, investigators. So it breaks new ground and it moves from efficacy testing with volunteers to the assessment of effectiveness with help seeking problem gamblers. It evaluates three well-defined models relative to standard care and enables a determination of the effectiveness of various kinds. Um, so we were wanting to compare these interventions with what the helpline did normally. Uh, but it particularly it was important that the interventions were, were, de were delivered consistently we had to manualize treatment as usual, uh, so that the, the, the you know there was uh, there was a degree of um, well consistency and homogeneity in what they were doing, and we could make the comparisons with the um, the other interventions. So there were now the other the three interventions I'm, I'm referring to. One is just a straight motivational interview over the telephone. The second condition was the same motivational interview but they also received by mail a self-instructional workbook. And then the third intervention was the motivational interview, the workbook, and then a series of follow-up booster sessions some months apart, linking back to, the, to the, um, the workbook. And so they varied in intensity from just the one session through to the most intensive one. And then standard care, I've already made reference to. So there was a team of helpline counsellors, actually most of the counsellors, who actually were trained to deliver 
all of these interventions. Uh, and, and the same councillors did treatment as, or the standard care or treatment as usual, as well as um, the, the motivation, interviewing interventions. So you had to be confident that they could reliably deliver those interventions and, and differentiate between them. We didn't want sort of, um, you know, soft air ward pollution. So a lot of uh, emphasis was put into training and monitoring them um, throughout the study to see that they delivered what they were supposed to be delivering. It's actually the largest trial um, in the problem gambling area. It's a very large number of participants. Um, and as I say, these are real life people seeking help in a, from the helpline. A very small number excluded for, um, for that reason. range of measures here and that we read through those. This information was collected by interviews over telephone, most of it by research, by researchers independent from um, the helpline. And we also um, had information from the people that were nominated by the client, people who knew them and could give an understanding of the client. Behaviour. Significant challenges in carrying out a study like this. Firstly, there's the issue of recruitment. I've mentioned the intervention of the delivery was, in, um, was, was with integrity and consistency. The follow-up assessment. A lot of people with serious problem gamblers, gam, you know, a lot of peop people with serious gambling problems, um, if they're demobile, they get phone cut-offs. They, they change addresses. Um, and, and, and also, you're making contact only by telephone. You, you don't have your street address. You don't, you know. So, staff changes. The study over a long period of time. That's an issue. Um, the Christchurch earthquake had an impact. Um, and then the helpline was liquidated. <coughs> That's a very big threat. Um, however, th um, it, it did transfer over, and, and there was some consistency in how we were able to continue. Okay, we carried out a pilot study, um, and based on that, we d it did lead to some ch changes, fine tuning. Uh, the study proper commenced in November 2009, um, and as I say, it's still continuing on in terms of the three year follow up. Very quickly, the allocation for four different conditions. of the elements that were compared. Uh, some of them are common across the two um, interventions, both um, the reasons for contact and helpline follow-up continue. Th those issues were covered in both conditions, but the, 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 but the other others are, are, are diff points of difference. So let me just read through that so that I break down some of these. elements, very high reliability um, between people who independently rated the, the interviews to see that they were being delivered, that those elements were coming through and that they, there wasn't overlap or pollution as such. The therapist um, delivered them consistently, computed shared elements, shared motivation <coughs> views. These are the people who were in involved in the study, similar number of men and women, wide range of um, general education. Most people had problems primarily associated with public health and addiction, vast majority. People admitted had problems for quite a period of time. 80%, they could choose their treatment goal. 80% chose the goal to stop gambling completely, and then 20% selected a, a, a controlled or reduced gambling goal. They were pretty confident that they were going to um, 
I just want two out of every two out of ten, so we're going to succeed. Um, the clients, the people that called, 84% were identified as having clinically significant um, symptoms of you know, mild mix of depression and anxiety. Um, nearly two thirds said they'd had an alcohol problem. So our primary hypothesis is that all groups would show a significant reduction in problem gambling, that the motivated inter interview groups would show similar improvements to treatment as usual. But we predicted that the more, the groups that got the more intensive um, intervention with the workbook or the boosters would show greater improvements, but we thought that those improvements might take some time to emerge. So those were our hypotheses going into the study. What was interesting was that um, there were no differences in treatment outcome in terms of sexual ethnicity and type of gambling. Um, mind you, the type of gambling, we didn't have a lot of variation, no sort of problems with gaming so much. Um, but with the um, ethnicity also, we were somewhat low on, on Asian or West Point Pacific Islander. It was very, you know, a, a, a sizable number of male and European was other. Um, and there weren't differences in terms of ethnicity and, and gender. And that's quite interesting because a lot of people make a big deal of it and think that women need a very specialised or different approach. There's a lot talked about um, the importance of um, specific interventions for particular, for particular ethnicity. Um, uh, it's important to know that it actually didn't make any difference. They all did as well. So here's the, the um, here's what we found. Um, the four groups. This is days gambled per month. So a very substantial improvement during the first three months, and then that was sustained. These are average. Some people did go up and down. They're at the individual level, these are averages across the, the group of groups as a whole. But you know, they're pretty substantial, clinically significant changes, not just statistically significant. This median money loss per day, again, substantial shift. Split or improve. Again, sustained and clinically significant shift. Problem gambling severity score. Um, PGSI past three months time frame. Again, you see um, very substantial shift. <coughs> Control of gambling behaviour. Test of Self-rated goals met. At the top, you've got people who test completely, largely partly not at all. And then there are those different you know, significant statistical um, performer groups. Um, but they all showed significant improvement. Now, these people had contacted the helpline, and, and part of the people seeking treatment as usual um, referral is a significant part of that intervention, the recommendation is the referral. Um, it's interesting um, that uh, around about a third of people, I think out of the course of the, of the, um, the trials, did receive some other type of assistance, and that included face-to-face -face counselling. And it was pretty interesting enough, the, the, uh, the standard treatment there wasn't more seeking additional help than was the case for motivated interview. Okay, so the main findings, participants in all groups, there was sustained statistically and clinically significant improvements on the primary outcome measures, substantial improvements in problem gambling severity, self-rated control over gambling, impacts on work, social, family and home life, health, um, psychological distress, depression and quality of life. These are other things I didn't show you previously. I mean, I haven't shown you all of the data. Uh, on all of those measures. There was less change with regard to alcohol misuse and smoking. Um, <coughs> so at the first two hypotheses, there was corroboration for them. The, the data were consistent with those hypotheses. 
but there were no additional improvements with the, the work that, that Abus was doing. So the minimal intervention for most people did as well as the more intense intervention. However, having said that, on some particular measures, some of the subgroups did do better than other basic intervention, and in some cases, um, the, the treatment was easier. And the people that did better on only some measures, mind you, just some, remember that, not across the board, generally across the board, everybody did well, it doesn't matter what their ethnicity or what their age or what, or whether they got the brief intervention or the longer one, didn't matter. They all did well, according to general data. Um, but on some measures, and this is consistent with the hypotheses that we had, people that had a low belief in achieving their treatment goal did better with more intensity. Those with control rather than abstinence goal also did better. People with more severe gambling problems did better with more intensity for some measures. Those that had, had high psychological stress and alcohol abuse. Every study has limitations. Um, we didn't identify what were the sort of essential therapeutic ingredients that drive problems. Um, we don't know why there were similar outcomes compared across the interventions. Um, and then it's also worthwhile understanding why some subgroups appear to do better with intervention in different intervention durations. So I mentioned the 36 month follow up. Um, we're hopeful that there will be extension over jurisdictions. David Hodgkins is actually trialling these interventions currently uh, through internet delivery in, in Canada, so that trial is underway. Um, carbon thoughts. Um, with regard to these brief interventions, are they has, you know, hastening the natural process? We know from our longitudinal studies in the general population that many people with gambling problems overcome them in the end. There's life crises or there are other events, they don't seek professional help. We know, however, that it's fluctuating. The number of people lapse. The question is, do these brief interventions, do, are they hasten this sort of natural process, um, or are they a significant therapy in their own right? Um, and the, the challenge is to position them both to hasten self-recovery, but also to increase um, treatment sequence. So that's, that's the sort of role of these things. But I mean, I, to me, um, the pro and I suppose the main message here is that the services that we're providing for most people are doing a pretty good job. And by the way, the numbers have said we are independent judge based on their behaviour, too, from people on one level. Um, and I think it's important in terms of step four that one should make brief, cost-effective interventions available to everybody, like on the phone, the internet, um, but then be able to pick up and, and refer on to more intensive interventions for those who require it. Um, I think that's probably the I see it the main take out that 